Sounds True presents Mindfulness for Beginners with the founder of the Stress Reduction Clinic at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center, John Kabat-Zinn. Welcome to this program that's called Mindfulness for Beginners. I'm delighted to be working with you in this way, and I do so in the hope that whatever it was that drew you to the allure of mindfulness, that that very impulse can be explored and nurtured so that it will grow and develop, because no one comes to a program such as this by accident. There has to be some underlying impulse that longs for a certain knowing or way of being that may feel elusive but is also sensed as highly desirable. Otherwise, you wouldn't even bother to pick up a program such as this. Also, each one of us brings our own genius to such adventures. And we always build on what's come before in our lives, even if much of it was and perhaps still is painful. Our entire past, whatever it's been, when it comes right down to it, becomes the very platform for doing the work of being in the present moment. And it becomes both the work and the adventure of a lifetime not to be trapped in either our past or our ideas, but rather to reclaim the only moment that we ever really have. And that is always this one. And taking care of this one can have a remarkable effect on the next moment and so on the future. In this session, we'll be having a conversation of sorts, although with such a format, I'm going to be the one that winds up doing all the talking. But we will be exploring the whole subject of mindfulness together, as if you'd never heard about it and had no idea what it was or what meditation is and why it might be worth cultivating. We'll cover what it is, how to cultivate it in your life, what its various benefits might be in terms of stress and pain, health and illness, Of course, we can only touch on these topics in this format, and all my comments are only to enhance your motivation to make use of the other session, which guides you in the actual practicing of mindfulness, and to have some kind of framework for understanding why it makes sense to do something which seems as strange and alien as nothing, on a regular basis, on a systematic basis, in a disciplined way, to cultivate your own mind and your what I would call your deep inner resources for learning, for growing, for healing, and potentially for transformation of your understanding of who you are and how to live in this world. If you want to go deeper, there are no end of resources. Mindfulness as a subject is an entire universe. It has many, many facets and galaxies. It's infinitely deep and wonderful. And there are fortunately many, many superb teachers, past and present, going all the way back to the Buddha himself and even before the Buddha, whose writings and whose books and for the living ones whose retreats can be invaluable to connect with over the course of this lifetime, your lifetime. Much of what I will be saying is mapped out in my various books and in particular in Full Catastrophe Living and in Coming to Our Senses. So let's begin at the beginning. What is mindfulness? My working definition of mindfulness is that it's paying attention on purpose in the present moment as if your life depended on it, non-judgmentally. Actually, mindfulness is what comes out of paying attention on purpose in the present moment, non-judgmentally and as if your life depended on it. And that is Nothing else than awareness. Now, awareness is something that we're all intimately familiar with and yet complete strangers to. So the training in mindfulness that we'll be exploring together is really the cultivation of a resource that's already yours. It doesn't require going anywhere. It doesn't require getting anything. But it does require in some way learning how to inhabit another domain of mind that we are, as a rule, fairly out of touch with, even though, of course, if we didn't have it, we'd already be dead. Mindfulness is often spoken of as the heart of Buddhist meditation. 
But really, mindfulness is universal because it's about attention and awareness, as I've just said, and attention and awareness are capacities that are shared by all of us. Nevertheless, it is fair to say that the most refined and developed articulations of mindfulness throughout history and how to cultivate it come from the Buddhist tradition. But I think by the same token, it's important to keep in mind that the Buddha himself was not a Buddhist and even the term Buddhism wasn't established until the 18th century, and that term was coined by European religious scholars who had very little understanding of what the statues on the altars of temples were of some guy sitting cross-legged and what they were really about. What those statues and other Buddhist art objects are all about is actually the mind and states of mind. And the Buddha represents a state of mind that can simply be called, and he did speak about it in this way, awake. So the Buddha had some profound insights into the nature of the human mind that apply to any human mind, not just Buddhists or people practicing Buddhist meditation for that matter. Otherwise, really, it would be of no value. I like to think of the Buddha as a, a scientist, a genius of a scientist, really, who had no instruments at his disposal other than his own body and his own mind, and he used them to great advantage to explore the deep questions that he was interested in, like what is the nature of the mind and what is the nature of suffering? And of course, as with any instrument, whether it's a radio telescope or a spectrophotometer or a scale, you have to actually calibrate it first and stabilize the platform on which it sits so that you can get reliable readings. And part of the meditation practice that the Buddha came up with was to actually stabilize and calibrate the mind so that it could do the deep work of penetration. Obviously, if you were trying to look at the moon and you put your telescope on, say, a waterbed and then tried to, you know, find the moon, every time you shifted your posture even the tiniest little bit, you'd lose the moon in the telescope. So it's the same with the mind. If the mind is going to investigate itself, first you have to learn at least the rudiments of stabilizing the mind enough so that it can actually do the work of paying attention and being aware of what's actually going on beneath the surface of our own mind's activities, which often are what thwart us or distract us or carry us away someplace else, as you'll soon see. So for all these reasons, mindfulness is really universal and doesn't have anything to do with Buddhism in the sense of you have to be a Buddhist in order to practice mindfulness, or for that matter, even that you have to practice meditation in order to cultivate mindfulness. But if you understand meditation in the deepest of ways, then you can't possibly not practice meditation when you're cultivating mindfulness because they are no less than the same thing. It's this deep dimension of awareness that is ours already, but that we just are so unfamiliar with that we can't put it to use at the times in our lives that we need it the most. For close to 30 years now, my colleagues and I at the University of Massachusetts Medical Center's Stress Reduction Clinic have been using mindfulness within mainstream medicine as a profound resource for people facing stress, pain, and illness, and disease, who find that they don't receive full satisfaction from their health care and medical care, who, you could say, fall through the cracks of the health care system, and actually a lot of people fall through the cracks of the health care system and don't get full satisfaction. So the idea of the stress reduction clinic is to challenge people to see if there's not something that they can do for themselves as a complement to whatever their doctors and surgeons and the healthcare system as a whole can do for them to move towards greater levels of health and well-being. And when I say health and well-being, I mean on the deepest and broadest of levels so that ultimately it has to do not just with the health of the body or with getting people back to some kind of socially acceptable normal state, but what the true extent of being human actually is and coming to know the mind intimately and to be able to use it in ways that actually cultivate the wisdom and deep qualities of compassion and goodness that lie within us. This work, 
which has spread to clinics and medical centers and hospitals around the world in the past 10 plus years is known as mindfulness-based stress reduction or MBSR. Some of the methods we'll be practicing in the second session are the same as those we use with our patients in the hospital.